introduce Father Chris to you. I know many of you already know what a wonderful man he is, but just say a little bit of history. <coughs> He's currently, um, we're very blessed to have him as our parish priest here at Penshurst and Peakhurst Bar Parishes. He's been involved in leadership in youth ministry, new communities, parishes and schools since 1993 and was the coordinator of the pilgrimage of the World Youth Day Cross and Icon in pre preparation for World Youth Day in 2008. Father Chris's PhD focused upon the RCIA program as a resource for theology and practice of youth ministry. He's the co-editor of Australian Catholic Youth Ministry Theological and Pastoral Foundations for Faithful Ministry, quite a mouthful, and the author of In Light of the Cross and Bring Forth Hope, Pope Francis Speaks to the Youth of the World, which both <laughs> provide reflections for young people on, in Christ and Catholic faith. We welcome Father Chris and his address to us. I'm not taking a selfie, I'm just putting the clock in front of me. So. <laughs> okay, so um, what my plan is to do today is um, I'm going to talk for a little bit and then I'm going to get you to talk for a little bit and then we can have a little bit of a, a Q&A uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll break for the actual launch of the centre as we were talking about before. And then um, we'll come back and we'll, um, we'll do the same thing again. I'll talk for a little bit. We'll uh, let you have a chat for a little bit and then we'll come back for some more questions and answers. Does that sound like a plan? Does that sound okay? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right. So, um, might, you, might feel, you might wonder if you're out here under false pretenses because that's not the same title that you would have seen on the flyer. What we decided to do is actually to break up these talks. And so, it's really around youth ministry in a secular age. Um, but we're going to pick up to begin with in this uh, first day together today and we'll look at particularly around um, what does it mean to talk about a secular age because secular is one of those words that um, we might think we know what it means until we've had a chance to, until we, someone asks us to define it and then all of a sudden we're thinking, well, maybe that's not quite so self-evident as to what that means. Um, and I think it's really important that we understand something about it. So the first talk today, uh, the talk today is, that's said the title of uh, one of the books that I edited is uh, A Mouthful, so is the title of the talk. Um, so reading the signs of the times, understanding secularity through the voices of young people. Okay, so where, do, where might we start? We have to do something about the youth said every parish pastoral council that I've ever known for you know, the last 40 years, right? Um, for obvious reasons, okay? There's a reason why this is a refrain, there's a reason why this is a, a, a key theme. It's because we know that we've struggled as a church for at least 40 years to retain uh, our young people, or to another way to put it, is to pass on faith to our young people now into several generations, right? So really, um, I'm going to argue in the course of today, since the 60s, since the 1960s. So um, this is always been the, this has been the case so we've always had um, parish councils saying how what are we going to do how are we going to fix this and so i want to try and um explore that that really in a sense um the what is the something is the focus of my doctoral research and so i'm going to unpack over the next um uh next little while a number a number of ways where we're going to look at what what a, a solution or a response to that might be um so as I said, what we're actually going to do uh, as part of the centre is actually have four talks. And so you can see them there. The first one today looks at the, the signs of the time, so understanding that word secular or secularity. And the second one is um, going to look at uncovering the church's process of evangelisation. How does the church respond to the task? Or how does it get engaged in the task of reaching out to young people? And then thirdly, we're going to have a look at conversion. Okay, that's one of those words that, again, we think... Um, can mean lots of different things, and so we're going to look at that because that's actually really crucial for evangelisation as well. And then finally, uh, in the light of all that, the last one, we'll try and put that all together and say, well, what's youth ministry look like in the light of what we've been doing and talking about together today and over these sessions? So you thought you were coming to one, there's four. Um, part of that, I'm really excited about that. I've, I've presented, um, you know, I've kind of done the doctoral thesis as a TED talk, like in 20 minutes, 
not on TED, not on the actual TED Talks, you can go Google that. But you know what I mean, you know, 20 minute talk, 80 minute talk, I've done that, done it in an hour. It's really nice to have a chance to kind of unpack this in a little bit more uh, depth, uh, which is what we wanted to do as part of the launch of the centre. Okay, so here's a quote to start off with. This is from a 15 year old girl from the largest study of young Australians' attitudes to faith and spirituality. Religion at school confuses me. We're told to believe things sometimes. Like at our last assembly last year, our principal pretty much told us we had to believe in God and the church. Kind of annoying because we all feel we want to believe in what we want to. I was kind of confused. I just kind of thought we don't have to do that just because you all tell us to. Right? Now, I suspect that there's a way that we could hear that and hear that as something like um, a rebellious teenager saying, don't tell me what to believe. Um, I'm not going to believe this just because somebody has, has told me that I should. Um, and you could hear it as anti-God, anti-church maybe. Um, so maybe anti-church but not anti-God, maybe both. Um, anti-authority even. But I wonder whether there's not something else going on here. Okay, And so part of the the talk today is really to try and suggest that there might be more going on than just a young person grows up and says, you know, I'm a, as a going through that rebellious kind of phase and chucks church in along with, you know, showering regularly if they're a bloke or being civil to their parents if they're a girl to really play the satirical gender stereotypes. Is that really what's happening here? Is that, is that really what's going on? I want to suggest that there's something a bit more subtle but much more powerful, okay? And so it's going to be important to pay attention to it. But to get a sense of that from a kind of a national perspective, let's have a look at that, just at the largest study of young people's attitudes to faith and spirituality that's been undertaken in Australia. It's an older study now, okay? It's, it's uh, 10, a little bit over 10 years old. Um, my, probably, if I think if they were doing it again today, this, the trajectory would actually be that this has actually increased, right? But in 2007, this is what they found, that first of all, that we've got a decline in religious uh, belief or in Christian belief. And so the group that they call traditional, which really is about traditional in the sense that in Australia, it was traditional to be a Christian in some way, um, still 46%, okay? They, they categorised of young people. There was a large cross, you know, and there was a telephone sample survey. So they interviewed a whole lot of people over the phone, young people, between the ages of uh, 16 and 29. So lots in that traditional. Then you can see their new age, okay, which sort of is a, it's a conglomeration of beliefs around things like reincarnation, tarot cards, astrology, that kind of thing. Then secular, so kind of not, I don't believe in God, I don't, I don't believe that there is a God. And then 9% from other world religions, obviously other than Christianity. Um, one of the most striking statistics that they found was that one in five people who've grown up in a Christian church are ex-members by the time they're 25. And for our church, the Catholic Church, another really challenging stat is that the decline away from Christian belief was happening very acutely in the Catholic Church and also in the Anglican Church okay, here in Australia. I'm not sure about you, I... I guess I, I found myself, as I've sort of thought about some of this, that um, I just wonder if it all works out quite so neatly, okay? So don't hold on to those numbers too tightly, they'll have changed, okay? They do the survey again, the numbers will be different, but the blue would be, the blue would be smaller, okay? We can promise you that, okay? But the situation gets a bit more complicated really quickly, okay? So the same study broke down traditional Christians into committed Christians. They were people who were at church um, every week or more, okay? Regular Christians were there pretty much two or three times in a month. Marginal Christians, maybe Christmas and Easter. Um, nominal Christians, well, they ticked on a Christian, but if they, if they could have, if they were old enough to, to be in the census, they would have ticked Christian in the census, okay? But they're not in, other, in any other way connected with the church. So when you break that down, You've got, and there are various other criteria about what the level of belief and the intensity of their belief. I'm going into that now, but you break that down, and it sort of the spread looks a little different, doesn't it? 
Similarly, they distinguish between New Age believers and New Age participants. A New Age believer says, oh, I believe in reincarnation or I believe in astrology or something like that. But they're not living, a kind of, they're not really committed to it. They're not engaged in lots of practices to do with what's been lumped under the New Age, okay, that heading of the New Age. Um, whereas New Age participants are practicing, you know, Reiki or they're practicing some kind of, they've, they've got a heavy level of engagement in those practices. And then that, that secular column, non-religious, that's 10%. So one in 10 young people never been religious, okay? Never never identified in any way with the belief in God. 4% ex-religious. They grew up in, a, in, a, in quite a significantly Christian family and no longer do. 14% undecided, okay? So three subtypes, three types rather, each of which are broken down into these subtypes. And all of a sudden, the picture starts looking a lot more complex, doesn't it? Um, it's not as straightforward as you know the Christian kids, the secular kids, and the, the people who are kind of you know believing in all sorts of weird and wonderful things, right? It's more complicated than that. Okay. Um, now I want to suggest that even that's insufficient. Okay, that doesn't do justice to young people today. That those labels are a bit too easy. Um, and don't do justice to the complexity of young people's attitudes to faith and spirituality. And so what I want to do is actually kind of drill down underneath that and say there's something more going on here, something much more, um, something that's actually more important to pay attention to in a way, because these are sort of, I think these are fairly blunt kind of labels in a way. So my intention and hope today is to kind of problematize this and say this is actually it's way more tricky than this. But also, when we, one of the, you don't problematize something just for the sake of making it harder. You do it to actually you hope that we might actually understand what's going on a little better as well. So that's the next step. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So, when that study asked the question, why is there a decline in belief and practice? They suggested a few things were quite likely. One was that that, there'd be, um, that there's been changing patterns of, um, of attitudes to Sunday. Once upon a time, there was an agreement in our culture, in our society, that you didn't do anything on Sunday morning. The shops were closed, you couldn't, therefore there weren't people working. Sport was on Saturday, especially for the kids. So Sunday morning there was this tacit and sometimes fairly explicit agreement that Sunday morning was for church. Okay, that's gone. And so what the uh, the authors of the study are saying is that all of a sudden now, faith is competing with uh, these other activities that are taking up our time. Okay, and you add, of course, the complexity of how much time, how much time people actually have available now, and the busyness of that that makes it even harder still. The second thing that they talk about is um is this is changing work hours. Okay, so that the, we now have we don't you know Sunday isn't the day of rest that it once was, and thirdly. Um, they speak about the triumph of consumerism, uh, somewhat bleakly saying, really, the fact that young people have so much access to money and cash, disposable incomes, they spend, their, their, and that's actually sort of, you know, that's antagonistic towards Christian faith. So when they look at the reasons why, and part of that was, they didn't just bring those up, they asked young people, um, you know, why is he going to church? What, what, does he, what does he think? These were the kinds of things that they pointed to. The word that gets thrown around to describe this decline is the word secularism, okay? The word secularism. The first time secularism appears in an official church statement is with Pope Paul VI in Evangelium Nunciandi. So this is the document Evangelization in the Modern World. It came out in 1975, the year I was born. Um, it's an old document. So there are young people here who have you're kidding me. Okay. That's the first time the word um, secular or secularism appeared, sorry, not secular, the first time the word secularism appeared in a papal statement. And you can see there the quote from Paul VI, that it's a concept of the world according to which the latter is self-explanatory without any necessary recourse to God, who thus becomes an encumbrance and superfluous. Okay, what's he saying? He's saying that um, the way in which a, a secularist view of the world rules out God, okay, and says that you can explain and understand everything about the world without any reference to God, who then becomes a problem because he, what he actually, what God actually wants is either he's unnecessary, superfluous, 
or actually an imposition, an encumbrance. Okay, so there's a the very first tone around secularism is this negative kind of take. Okay, Paul the sixth quickly just dis dis distinguishes it from secularization. So secularism is this secularization. He says is the legitimate process by which we don't say we don't press the God button to explain why things are happening. Okay. So the classic example of this would be modern science. So once upon a time, we thought that things happened because God made them happen. God did. God caused the things that were going on within the world. Whereas what we would now understand is that, well, there are scientific explanations for causality about why things happen. We understand that an earthquake isn't an act of God in some sense, but it's actually about the clashing of tectonic plates. Once upon a time, people didn't know that. So they said it was God's fault. So Paul VI is saying secularization is taking God out as the explanation for things that actually do have uh, a world, an explanation within the world. And he says that's okay. It's actually important that we do that. So one of the things that we're pointing to really clearly here is secularism is not the same as saying that science now explains the world. Okay? <coughs> what we're saying here is that there's a way of viewing the world that rules God out. John Paul II will make that a bit more explicit. Okay? In Evangelium Vitae, John Paul II says, let's see the quote, that secularism involves the eclipse of the sense of God and of the human being, and it inevitably leads to a practical materialism which breeds individualism, utilitarianism, and hedonism. John Paul II is not a fan of secularism either, is he? Okay? So you can see there what he's saying is that when we exclude God, what you end up with is hedonism, Utilitarianism, that's the idea that everything, anything's justifiable if it has a pragmatic outcome. What's the best outcome here? Okay? Um, and individualism, the fact that I'm not I'm an autonomous unit, I only need to rely on myself. Okay? So John Paul II there is saying that if you, um, if you rule out God, the result will be the eclipse of a human being, that we'll actually become more selfish, more narcissistic is a word that's sometimes used, um, more focused upon the self. Okay. So, is secularism then the defining feature of our age? Is it actually the thing that defines it, that we've actually ruled out God and maybe we're ripping the world into that? Um, now, this is not to pit popes against each other in any way, shape, or form, because Pope Francis will have some strong things to say about secularism as well. But I do find this quote of his quite arresting, okay? He says that we're not simply living in an era of change, but a change of era, okay? We're not simply living in, a change of, in an era of change, but we're living in a change of era, okay? What's he getting at? He's saying that we're actually living in a new moment. It's not just that we're living in a time where lots of things are, new things are happening all the time. I'll talk about that in a moment a bit more. He's saying that actually we're, we're living in this moment of seismic change, okay? Um, I want to suggest to you that the last time the world went through a change on this scale was about 500 years ago, okay? With the birth of the printing press, with the Protestant Reformation, it's the birth of what we call the modern world, okay? So this might be, the, we might be, we're either living in the death throes or the birth pains of what happens after the modern world, okay? Sometimes that's called post-modernity. Um, the philosopher that I've drawn on most heavily here talks about it being late modernity because he doesn't think we've got to the next week yet. But we're in the, we're in the final, maybe even the final days or the final hours of that time. So I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Okay. Here's, here's the question around the, the word secularism though. If secularism just equals this worldview of God that, that results in the decline of belief and practice, so less people believe in God, less people show up to church, if secularism is just that and if it's really the time bomb or it's really, the, it's really already exploded and it's <coughs> wreaking its effect, has that really, is it one of those words that actually hasn't really told us much? Has it, really, has it really explained much of what's happening, okay? If we just equate secularism to the decline of belief and practice, which I think is what happens usually when people say, Australia's becoming a secular country. That's what they mean. They say less people are coming to church, less people are believing in God, 
people, particularly unless, unless people are believing in the Christian God. So part of what could happen to, and people often say this, I think, is they suggest that the causality can work in both directions. John Paul II says, if you get rid of God, what you end up with is narcissism, hedonism, individualism. There'd be some, another school of thought that says, actually, what you, what you do is if you've got kids who, particularly young people, but our whole culture, who are so overwhelmed by their purchasing power, by the digital world in which they live, that they become more, self, more selfish, that they become more individualistic, that they're just in it for a good time, um, the result is that God gets squeezed out. So can you see how the causality gets argued in both directions? Get rid of God, we become more selfish, or we're already more selfish and therefore we're getting rid of God. We should always be suspicious of a circular argument. We should always be suspicious of a circular argument. Because what's happening there is that both factors are claiming to cause the other. Is it, it, it might just be a whole lot more complicated than that. It might just need a bit more investigation. So let's, uh, let's do some investigating. So, talk about Charles Taylor for a moment. So Charles Taylor is a Canadian philosopher who's now, I think in his very late 70s, it could even be, he might even be 80. Okay. Um, one of my good friends uh, says that Charles Taylor has written the first book of the new century, of the 21st century, that will be read in the 22nd century. Okay. So he's, in other words, he's saying it's a really important book. The book's called Secular Age. Okay. I brought it up with me. I would have brought it up with me, but I decided that I didn't want to put my shoulder out. It's a really new book. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really important book. It's called, so it's called A Secular Age. And Taylor's asking a really important question. What Taylor wants to know is if we did look at secularism as the decline of belief in practice, okay, belief in practice, and if we think about secularization as that process by which we recognize that what we used to think God directly caused, there are now explanations, particularly through science, that explain it, have we really got to the bottom of our secular age? And Charles Taylor says, definitely not. Okay. So what he looks at is this question. Is there a third way of talking about secular, which he says he calls secularity, um, where, and where we can answer the question and understand a little bit better is, is that how have we moved in Western cultures like Australia from a, a place where we, it was 500 years ago, at that, remember that last sort of seismic change, at that point, everybody believed in God. Okay? What we now call atheism is a really is a much later phenomenon than that. Okay? So how do we get in the space of 500 years to a point where we've gone from everybody believes in God in Western societies, okay, in fact, uh, virtually every culture in the world, to a place now where in our world, a place like Australia, belief is really problematic. And to believe is actually, it's not the easiest option, and for some people it proves virtually impossible to, you know, almost impossible to make a decision about what to decide for. That's the question he wants to explore, and he does that over about 800 pages. And at the beginning of the book, he says, I really won't be able to tell this story in all of its fullness. Okay, so, what he's talking about there then is the condition, what he wants to get at is what are the conditions of belief? How, what do we need to look at that makes belief possible in a world that has rapidly changed? That's the question that he's trying to get to and answer. Okay. So Taylor's, Taylor's take on that is this. Um, these two guys talk about uh, different things starting with A. So the guy at the top left, that's, uh, he looks like he's anxious, doesn't he? That's W.H. <laughs> w. Borden, okay? So a great poet. And uh, he wrote a poem called the, the Age of Anxiety. Okay, the age of anxiety, back actually in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Okay? So he was, um, he was onto something though, wasn't he? Like, we, this is an anxious time, right? Like, I don't think, if it was anxious in 48, I don't think he's got any less anxious in the 60 years intervening, okay? Anxiety is a thing. This guy is Thomas Friedman, and uh, he talks about the age of accelerations. 
He says that technology, globalisation and climate change are all accelerating exponentially. They're all accelerating ex exponentially. And the crucial example that he gives about that is that this, this is called Moore's Law, in case you're interested, you can check it out. The speed and power of a microchip doubles every two years, and it's been doing that for 50 years. Actually, it's really since the invention of the microchip. So that's why I can have a phone in my pocket, where once upon a time, the kind of technology that would have been required to power it would have been larger than this room. In fact, it would have been impossible. So uh, ex exponential acceleration of technology, he says of climate change and of globalization. Okay, so this is these are two two guys saying here are two ways of understanding the world that we live in. Taylor has a third, and I want to suggest that for understanding young people, but not just young people, also understanding ourselves if we're not only characterizing ourselves as young, um, to understand our world. Okay, the world in which we're in. Taylor calls it the age of authenticity. The age of authenticity. So let's explore that a little bit. Taylor says that the age of authenticity is actually a moral ideal. It's really important to grasp this, okay? He's saying that people make choices and live by the idea that it's really important to be true to myself. But it's often, this is often not strongly articulated, particularly as a moral ideal. And it's often perhaps, so often perhaps is inadequately expressed as a consequence. And yet it profoundly shapes young people, and I would, would also want to argue not just young people's lives. Okay? How did the age of authenticity start? Taylor says that in the 1960s, uh, Western societies underwent a cultural revolution, okay? Where the key feature for Taylor, okay, we, we, immediately, immediately when we think 60s, you think sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? But underneath that is what Taylor says is the rise of expressive individualism as a mass phenomenon. So let's explain what that let's explain what that is. What's expressive individualism? It's that each of us has an original way of being human. Now it might strike you that that doesn't seem so crazy or outrageous. How is that a revolution? Doesn't, doesn't that kind of be something you go, well, yeah, duh, Chris. If you want proof that the age of authenticity is really alive and that expressive individualism is really powerful, think of every Disney hero for the last 20 years, hero or heroine for the last 20 years. They've got to be true to themselves. They've got to be who they're going to be. Think of Elsa telling everyone to let it go, right? Okay? So they've, the idea here is that we have our own original way of being a human being that is peculiar to us and it's to be found by ourselves and by looking inward to discover who we are and who we're meant to be. And that has become so pervasive, that has become so powerful and ideal in our lives that nobody even questions it. It's like, of course, of course. What Taylor's saying is it wasn't always so. Okay? Expressive individualism actually begins with the romantic movement, that group of artists who actually went, they may were saying to themselves, we've got to express who we truly are, and we've got to do that through our art, whether that was poetry or painting or music. And that, through a complex kind of process, has actually now become part of the whole culture. That we now understand that as being, it's an axiom, it's something that we just, it's so embedded in us that we take it for granted, okay? But it was not always so. So Taylor says that this is powerful, and, and particularly anything that we can't name, is really powerful, right? Because it's actually working underneath the surface. So part of Taylor's service, service to us here is to say, let's actually name it and call it for what it is. Um, if I'm not true to myself, of course, I miss the point of being me. I can, I'm actually failing in the project of being myself, of being fully human. That's the, so this is the ideal that's at work. And for Taylor, he says this is, people, people live their lives by this, but not necessarily consciously. It's just, it's embedded as it were in the, in the culture. What that means is that, let's just, so let's just revisit our opening quote. What that means is, 
we can read this a little bit differently. Remember I was saying, is this about anti-authority? Is this anti is this rebellion? Is it anti-religion? Or is there something else going on? If you read it through the lens of authenticity, what she's objecting to is she's objecting to the fact that someone's telling her who she is. Right? She's not being rebellious for the sake of it, per se. She's not being anti-God for the sake of being anti-God. She's saying, hang on a minute, I get to work out who I am. Yeah? I get to decide what makes me tick. Back off. Now, that's got huge challenges for us as a church, and we're going to actually unpack just how big that challenge is bigger than maybe even we're first thinking at this point. Okay? But we need to hear it a little differently. She's not in full scale rebellion. She's not, you know, this is not somebody who's kind of adopted a sort of a countercultural lifestyle per se. We don't know, I don't we don't know anything about her. But my guess is that she's probably a really nice young person. Yeah? She's just saying, I've got to work out who I am. I've got to decide whether religion or spirituality play a part in that. You can't tell me. Okay? She's appealing to the idea of authenticity. Yeah? Okay. So, part of this then, what we're saying here is that authenticity is about identity now, okay? If I've got to discover who I am, what it means to be a human being, I need to work, that's about who I am, it's about, it's about my sense of self, okay? The thing that Taylor points out, which I think is an incredibly important point, is that, we, that it would look like with that ideal of authenticity, that that's just simply a solitary kind of task. That I've got to discover my identity over and against everybody else in a way. But Taylor says, actually, that's not really how we work out our identity at all. We always work out our identity in relationship. And human beings have always done so. The difference between our time, and by that I mean the period from the 60s to the present, and previous times, was that once upon a time, identity was formed by other relationships much more strongly by the culture. So if you were the son of a baker, okay, you would grow up to be a baker. Okay? You're, if you were a peasant, okay, you couldn't suddenly become a noble. The, the rare exceptions of those stories are rare and noteworthy in their stories because that's actually, it's actually something breaking the social and cultural taboo. If you're, if you're born the king or the son of a king, you're the king. Yeah? Okay? So, uh, so much of identity in, pre in a previous age was given to people by their social standing, by their class, okay? And then within that, by their relationships, <coughs> the people that they were with and that sort of thing. What's different now is that we say now, if you're the son of a baker, you can be anything you want. If you're the daughter of a builder, you can be anything you want. You are not bound to, you are not committed to being, um, to staying within those social boundaries that once there, in fact, those social boundaries simply aren't there anymore, okay? So the idea here then is that I'm still though working out who I am in relationship with others and the family is still crucial for that, okay? So I was talking to some people before we started today and we were talking about the place of family in relationship to faith. Family still matters immensely, okay? Family matters in the formation of, of identity, crucially, because I work out who I am in those relationships, and to some extent, over and against them, you know? Um, some people in the, in the audience today have met, just met my folks for the first time in this past week, and they look at they look at my dad and they look at me and they go, well, the apple didn't fall far from your tree, right? Like, I, I look like my dad very, very deeply, right? Like, and I often say now, um, I look like my dad, but in, interiorly I'm all mum, right? <laughs> Part of my identi identity formation there, though, is to be able to say, there are times when I'm just like dad. I remember very clearly one time um, listening to some jazz, having just played a game of golf, and having a glass of red wine, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm my father. <laughs> <laughs> so the familial in influence is huge, right? But I've also defined myself over and against my dad in some ways too, right? There's some things about dad, but I've said, you know what, I'm not going to do it like dad when I grow up. I'm going to be a little different, okay? I'm shaping who I am in relationship to dad, but also saying I want to be a little different to dad too. And the same goes for mum, 
and my sister. It happens in the context of my immediate family. One of the interesting things about our time too is it really is your immediate family, a nuclear family too. Once upon a time, some of that process would happen in a much larger context. Okay? The other part of this is that it makes romantic relationships really powerful. Okay? That romantic relationships are, are identity forming activities. Okay? So I discover who I am in relationship to a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or also to really close friends. This is part of how I work out who I am. The people that I choose to be friends with, the person that I want to go out with. Young people are shaping their identity by those choices in relationship. Okay. The significance of that is that those relationships are, it, it, what, what, what does that mean? It means, that, it means now that to break up with somebody is not just you know, they don't like each other so much anymore. It can be that. It can be much more powerful because it can actually be that part of my identity is being challenged or threatened. Yeah. It actually seems to have gone because I know I'm no longer with the person that I was with. Okay? So the power of, of relationships uh, to shape who we are, Taylor says, is really crucial. Okay? We're not forming it. Even though the ideal of authenticity says, I discover who I am in relationship to going inside, working out, working out who I am by looking at myself and what makes me tick. In reality, I'm doing that in a dialogue, sometimes overt, sometimes implicit, with other people. Okay. How are we tracking? I'm going to just uh, do a couple more slides and then, we'll, and then we'll stop for a minute and have a little chance to unpack this a little bit. I'm conscious that um, we're, we're covering some ground, okay? So, um, so the next thing I want to just reflect upon then is that if we live in the age of authenticity, that means that the religious practice or my understanding of spirituality, for it to, for it to be any, in any way meaningful to me, it's got to speak to me, okay? If, it, if I'm going to say, the practice of faith, for example, or a spiritual belief or a spiritual practice, whatever it may be, if it's going to be important, if it's going to, be, if it's going to shape my identity, if I'm going to say that's expressive of something of who I am, it has to speak to me. It can't just be something that's imposed from without. Now again, there's a good chance that as you're listening to that, you might be thinking, well, Dirk, Chris, of course, that's obvious. But it really wasn't obvious. Up and, and this, and this, is, this is where, in, the, in the, the moment as this shift happens, people were bewildered by what took place because they just thought, if you just say to people, this is what you need to believe, that will be sufficient to help them believe. If you just said a little louder, you really do need to believe in God, they'd suddenly do it, okay? The, I, the belief was, the understanding was that we just need to tell them better and they'll do it rather than the understanding that now is so built into us is, well, of course it's got to resonate with me. Of course it's got to resonate, resonate with my sense of self and who I am, and therefore it reflects me in some way. Doesn't that have profound implications, though? And can I just say, suggest, too, is that sometimes some parts of the church can be slow to catch up on that. And so if there, there's a shift that's got to happen here in our response to this, that, you know, Sometimes, sometimes we do yell just a little bit louder, hoping the young people will suddenly pay attention. But rather than what we've actually got to find ways of doing it is how do we actually speak in such a way that the young person says, oh, they talk, someone's talking about my life, explaining who I am. This is actually, this is actually deeply real and personal to me. Okay. <coughs> All right. What this means is that Religion, sometimes you might think that religious faith or Christian institutions or other religious institutions too have, are disappearing from our world. I want to suggest that what's actually happened is that it's moving. Okay, it's looking different. Okay? It, it, it isn't, it's not disappearing. Okay? Expressions of faith and spirituality and some expressions of religion are popping up all over the place and all the time, but it looks different from the way that it wants to. We need to think a little bit about what that might look like and how then we might respond to it. All right. So, at this point, I reckon perhaps you could just turn to one or two people around you, just buzz through a little bit. 
Um, and particularly around if, the, if you want to pick up anything, I'll cover a fair bit of ground fairly quickly. You know, the first 500 pages of the table is kind of just kidding. <laughs> just, um, just turn to, to someone uh, next to you. Just a little buzz. What struck you? What did, what did you paint? What did you notice? What did you just passionately disagree with and you want to talk about? Yeah, we'll definitely. Well, I guess, um, I guess what I thought we might do just for um, a few minutes is um, just give you a chance, if you've got a, a comment or a question, um, you want to clarify something, you want to tease it out a little bit further, just to give you that opportunity. So um, just ask you maybe just to do that in a loud voice because we know that we've got one microphone back here. So, so nice and clear. My, my comment is in relationship to Vatican II. I lived both before it and after it. And uh, the after it is a mess. Uh, for a lot of us, we just were left in the veins and had to find out our own way through for the last 50 odd years. So I'm not surprised at all that children um, and young adults uh, have a declining um, affiliation with any kind of religion. Because the, the the children and the grandchildren of us who were left in the lurch in the 1960s, basically. Yeah. That's how I think. Yeah. Well, I'm, um, I'm going to defer to you as someone who's lived through it, because that's your experience, right? So um, the only thing I would comment on that is that... Um, uh, so it, it's, it's a crazy piece of timing that as... And it, and it was both prophetic and kind of... Um, as I read it, as I look back on that period of history, you know, obviously being born later, it was a prophetic moment to, for, the, for Vatican II to be called, and yet it also coincided with the beginning of this seismic shift in culture. So part of what made it prophetic was John 23rd seeing that in some way. I don't think he could have understood it all by any means, but he saw something of it and caused the council. But what you then had happened then was you had the... the as where the cultural work got pulled out underneath the feet of the church, just as the church was trying to make sense of that change. So it's like a double whammy. Um, so I, I suppose, um, you know, I reckon when I was, I reckon when I was uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, I would have been cranky about how that all played out and the ramifications for me, because I grew up in the, you know, religious education was a, you know, Imagine a pink fluffy cloud and you're sitting and floating on a cloud. It was a long way away from the Christian gospel, right? Um, and it was. <laughs> but I'm also a little bit for, uh, forgiving too because I think, man, they, you don't know what you're living through while you're living through it. Um, and you don't necessarily know how to adjust to that. So and I'm particularly conscious, always conscious of this with parents. Mm -hmm. I think I said it in homilies for Pentecost last weekend. Um, you know, for, par for parents who've tried their best to pass on faith in these last 50 years to their kids, man, what a challenge, mm -hmm. right? We're living through a scope of change that we haven't seen for 500 years and you're expected to do what you were told to do and that that would magically somehow still work. Mm -hmm. Tough. Very, very tough. Nick? And um, this, this phenomenon that's kind of born out of the three ages that you mentioned that you could term as a fourth age, this phenomenon of accessibility, where everything is accessible all the time and then that we've really struggled to translate that into how we communicate the faith without watering things down. And sometimes people have gone too far away as well. Um, age of accessibility as well. Yeah, definitely a product of the three, for sure. Yeah, okay. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I, it's interesting you put it all in that age of authenticity, and I think we can see that so evidently in a similar age to yourself, you know, that, that real introspection that we had and who am I and all that growing up. Um, and ultimately, I think these days you can see it in gender politics <coughs> as well, in, in that authenticity, who am I not even in the way I think and act, but who am I as a sexual human being? But my question is, that's very much coming out of our Western, almost Western cultural context. In Australia, obviously, multicultural context, especially with the huge um, number of people from, say, the African countries, from Asia and other countries, where that sense of community is so much stronger still. You know, 
they don't speak in terms of I, they only speak in terms of we. How does this interplay, especially in our parishes, when we don't, when it crosses those cultural boundaries? Yeah. And, and what do we do there? Yeah. It doesn't work in those cultural boundaries. So fantastic question, um, and we're going to we're going to unpack that some a key part of that a little bit further in part two, so later this afternoon. Um, but to say just to make a comment about it now, um, one of the things that um, has is really clear about our oh, first of all you're spot on. Okay, so it, it isn't almost the age of authenticity isn't almost a Western phenomenon. It is a Western phenomenon. Okay. And so we have, and we live in a, a society here where we have people coming from other cultures outside the West, and they're particularly shaping our faith communities. Um, there's a couple of implications. One is that's a great asset, okay, because they come with a richness of faith and a, an understanding of some things that we might perhaps have lost. You point to a communal kind of sense in some ways. However, we also need to be aware that um, that the, if the phenomenon of um, cultural diffusion across the generations continues the way it has in previous eras, and there's no real reason to think that it won't, yeah. what will happen is that the dominant dominant secular culture, the, dom the dominant, is what we've just been talking about, will actually, um, you know, like the, um, the generation of South, the people from South India will be able to withhold it for a generation, maybe even a second generation, but a third, and all of a sudden, they're, they're looking indistinguishable from the non-practicing, marginal, and local Caucasian male or female like I am. Right? So, so that I think that that's a salutary moment to think hey, we're a few generations away from that. Like we've been, in a certain sense, our church has been in inverted commas saved by mm -hmm. the recent influx of migration. Right? Yeah. But it's it's like a temporary state of execution. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, because without something different going on, okay, the the children of the Filipinos who've come, or um, the people from Vietnam, they will practice, but their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren, because of the issue, okay? Because of the power of this, right? Because it's dominant, okay? So we, we've got to be challenged there. But stay, stay tuned for a few more thoughts about that in the session, in the session later this afternoon. Probably one more. I'm looking at my non-existent watch. Um, <laughs> maybe one or two more questions and we'll, and we'll break. I guess the, obviously it's, kind of, it's a huge challenge for objective morality mm. and for institutions, mm. uh, which we both sort of strongly for as Catholics. Mm. Uh, and um, it, it's sort of bewildering as to how to meet this in the mm. So one of the, one of the things that Taylor will say about the question around morale, around the moral implications of this is he says, look, it looks very obvious that you end up in relativism, okay? So it's, you know, if, if I'm going to be true to myself, I need to do this, I need to walk out of my commitment or my vow, for example. You know? Or I can do this because it was it felt that this was right, the right thing to do, even though it was deeply damaging to somebody else. You know? That that soft relativism, he says, is is a certainly a logical pathway, but it's not actually, it's actually, he says it's actually intellectually untenable. And the reason why he says that is that, he says, look, not, we don't think that everything's equal. So if someone who says, I'm a relativist, you know, they, they, they say, what's good for you is good for you, what's good for me is good for me, I, I work out my morality, you work out yours, anything kind of goes. People who buy into the, into the ethic of authenticity, which of course he's saying is all of us to some degree, He's saying um, we don't actually live like we actually don't in reality live like relativists. Okay, the example I, I give you is this: if you say if the ideal here is you've got to be true to yourself, okay, and that means that you know somebody like a you know a twenty-two year old guy spending all of his time he has got a job he's spending all of his time gaming, okay, right? We would say that he's not being true to himself. And not just we who come from a faith base, but you know other people in his life who wouldn't have any kind of commitment necessarily to faith and say, you're not being true to yourself, wasting your time playing a game day in, day out. Taylor calls, it, calls them inescapable horizons of significance, which is another way of saying there are some moral absolutes. <laughs> um, they're, they're part of, so did you hear what's, what's happening there? He's appealing 
We appeal to the idea of authenticity to say you're not being authentic to yourself when you sit on that computer all day. You're not being true to your deeper sense of who you are. So there are some resources within this idea, even though there's also some massive challenges. Okay? Um, the other part of that too will be that we as Christians don't want to absolutize this, you know, I don't think I think I don't think we can fight the idea of authenticity. Okay, nor do I think we should. You know, my, my father was an economist. I don't want to be an economist. You know, the day dad, the day I knew I was okay to be a priest, was dad said, "We well, don't want to be an economist. You can be anything body I want." Um, <laughs> my point is, is that none of us are really disputing the fact that we should actually have the capacity to decide for ourselves about who we are and who we're becoming. But what we also want to say is that we, let's not absolutize that because we're going to end up, from a faith point of view, we're going to end up in, to use the theological term, we're going to end up in adultery. We're going to end up worshipping something else. Right? But that's getting ahead of ourselves. And that's associated with God abuse problems as well. You know, in, yeah, right. So, so, so somebody who says it's okay for me to do that, we, we'd all say, hang on a minute, you're not being true to who you are. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely right. That's the reason why with the yeah. young people today, it needs to be. And then you've got a stake or whatever it is that they think they're saving from, um, in addition to what they're saving from. Yeah. It's another key that's related to that. Definitely. The other part that Father like Ken pointed to was um, the fact that as a church we're an institution, and that this, is, this seems to spell big problems for an institution. Mm. Um, and there's some truth in that, okay? That young people, young person doesn't look at it. Uh, the church as an institution and go, great, I'd love them to tell me what I'm going to do about how to live my life, right? Okay. We'll talk more about that as well too, okay? Because what that's part of where I think we need to think about what does the renewal of the church look like in response, okay? Um, but it doesn't mean, and again, we'll talk about this in the second session, it doesn't mean that some people aren't going to find themselves in the church, okay? Just, it's, just, it's just not going to be, if we, it's, it's going to be that everybody makes their journey in that. So we'll come back to that after the break. At this point, over to you.